and welcome to County Board Wrap-Up, our monthly look at some of the important decisions the Arlington County Board takes at its monthly meetings. I'm Kara O'Donnell, your host, and with me here today, sitting in for Board Chair Jay Fassett, is Arlington County Board Vice Chair Katie Crystal, along with her board colleague Libby Garvey. And on today's show, we're going to be talking about the upcoming budget, GLUPs and RTAs, <laughs> Next Gen 911, and a whole lot more. And we're going to explain what that means. We will explain <laughs> what that means because it's a lot of acronyms all the time. Katie, Libby, thank you both for being here. Um, let's start out. We, I can't believe it is budget season again. It seems like we talk about this all the time, but the county manager did share his budget forecast with the board at this past month's meeting. And how would you characterize the outlook for the next fiscal year? Where do things stand at this point? Sure. So we are looking at a budget gap, at least on the county side of the ledger, and we're anticipating schools will identify their own budget gap as well. Uh, that doesn't mean that the economic picture isn't a good one in Arlington County. We do expect modest growth in assessments. Um, the county manager is assuming at this time no change to the tax rate. We do have the lowest tax rate in Northern Virginia, and we intend to uh, keep it in that sphere. Um, but even a Assuming that operations and services largely continue at the existing levels with the expansion of some transit service on sure. Columbia Pike, um, we are expecting pressures from both an increase in the funding required to Metro and then from the increase required in meeting the needs of more students at our public schools. I was just going to say that's really kind of the big, the elephant in the room. So we need this additional funding for both schools and for Metro. And the budget that the manager proposed doesn't even take APS into account at this point. Correct? Right. So the manager has not yet proposed a budget. That will come a little bit later in the process. Our next action as a board is to give direction to the manager. Basically what that does is set some parameters around what it is that we expect him to bring to us with his recommendations, which then we'll spend the spring deliberating on really unpacking a lot of deep dives and deliberative conversations uh, and then ultimately advance our own budget to become uh, the adopted budget we hope. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so it is correct that we've not yet seen APS's or the superintendent's proposed budget. Mm -hmm. They go through that same cycle. The superintendent, right. they, first the board gives direction, the superintendent proposes a budget, and then the school board adopts it. Theirs happens a little faster um, than ours does so that we can take the information about their needs uh, and roll it into or incorporate it into the overall adopted county budget. Mm -hmm. and, and I think what you're going to, what you heard there, that's a little different because this is going to be, I think, my 22nd budget, <laughs> if you count the school board budgets I did. <laughs> I flies, we're having fun. Um, I think we're doing a lot more talking about long term. Um, we, we're, you know, looking ahead, sort of a sense that we can't keep doing things just the way we've been doing them. We need to do them a little differently, and we're not going to want to do that suddenly. But to kind of look at, are there some ways we can do things differently, get some efficiencies, change a little bit how we approach things? Um, and while Metro and, and, and the schools, they are the elephant in the room, if you will, but it's an elephant we talk about a lot. Absolutely. <laughs> we talk about a lot. And for schools, not only is it the increase in students, it's the new schools. So when you right. put in a new school, it, so it, it, increasing students is like you have to hire teachers. When you put in a new school, that's a new principal. It's a new building. It's a new library. It's a, So there's... It, it's instead of just kind of gradually going up, you kind of take a step up. So that's one of the things we're going to be dealing with. Mm -hmm. But we did talk about you know that gap. What are some of the things you're looking at at this point? Granted, it's still very preliminary at this point. This is really just the start of the discussions. How are we going to kind of bring that together and get everyone on the same page? So the manager has been in conversation with his department heads for a number of months. And now we've started to, uh, rather staff has started to take this question to the public. Uh, what can we live without? What's really important for us to protect? Uh, are there areas that we'd like to see grow and at the expense of which other programs? Um, the county manager's office has been engaging in a series of roundtables all around the county. I know there was one last night just at uh, Langston Brown Community Center on Lee Highway to ask people exactly those questions. He's also been meeting with our commissions, who are folks who study mm -hmm. particular areas of the budget really deeply um, and often have especially informed feedback to give us uh, about, as Libby was saying, what things we might do differently differently, uh, what areas we could refine, um, and what areas really need some attention in this upcoming budget. Now, you mentioned the budget roundtables. This is something that's very new this year, that really hearing, hearing from the community, different factors of the community, this early in the process, in this kind of smaller, intimate roundtable setting. Let's talk a little bit about just Sure, they actually began last year. Um, and last year, they were uh, often joint with APS. Mm -hmm. um, I do think the number of them has expanded and grown this year, because I think our citizens are interested in coming mm -hmm. to participate. The other way that we take feedback, of course, is by comments online, um, which is something that we always encourage people to do. We, not, we know not everybody can attend a meeting at 7 p.m. Sometimes that's witching hour for dinner or bedtime. <laughs> um, but uh, 
uh, we're really interested in really honestly continuously iterating, continuously improving, continuously finding more ways for people to engage. So this really builds on some work that began last year. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these smaller groups we think can get better conversation going and people really a little bit more intimate and you can really talk about things. Because sometimes we just, it, it feels a little bit like it's theater. We say this, they say, you know, and, and but to really communicate. I think we're trying to do that more, and I think that's really healthy. Have you heard that the dialogue's been going well I have, at this point? I have from some people. I don't know about you, Katie, but I've had some folks say they really, they're, they're liking it. So we'll see. And the discussions will continue up they through will. spring. They will. Now, the board also considered several requests to advertise at the October meeting, um, the first one being concerning accessory dwellings. So let's talk a little bit. You first approved those accessory dwellings almost a decade ago, um, and we're revisiting those now. Why? Well, in that almost a decade, we've seen very few of these accessory dwellings in Arlington County, and so we're revisiting the ordinance and potential changes to the zoning ordinance that might allow more flexibility so that we get more of them. And this is probably a great opportunity to talk about why we want to see more accessory dwellings, and in fact, what they are. Uh, they're probably most recognizable to people as English basements or granny, granny flats. flats. Right. In-law quarters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Kind of, yeah. And uh, they're an exciting opportunity for Arlington to think about how to introduce some affordability uh, into our single-family neighborhoods and how to allow more people to age in place. We know that the average rent for an accessory dwelling, the ones that we have, is about $1,000 a month, which is much more affordable than a lot of other rental housing options. We also know it's a great income stream and in fact the majority of people um, who have these accessory dwellings are seniors. So it's a great way to bring in a little bit of an income stream off your house and it's a great way to introduce diversity and a little more affordability of housing forms into our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. That said, we want to do that in a way that protects what people love about the neighborhoods, the way they look and feel, uh, the number of cars they might express ex expect on their streets, um, and the number of kids we expect for our schools. So we want to, to, to shape this uh, zoning ordinance amendment in a way that encourages accessory dwellings, but is also responsive to some of the concerns we've heard from the community. Because specifically talking the parking things, these are not areas that have the big parking garages for the condo buildings or what have you. These are often those smaller side right. streets with the, the single family, family homes and you know and because this is a, a zoning ordinance amendment that would apply to most of our single family neighborhoods it's important to note they're not all concentrated around transit mm -hmm. so often when we add uh, more people more housing units we do so in a really uh, coordinated way where those people can take transit and don't have to rely on cars um, the accessory dwellings will be permitted in, in neighborhoods where the access to transit um, isn't quite as robust okay and what's interesting is you didn't actually take action on this um, to, at the meeting, but rather went through that RTA, or rather request to advertise. Tell me a little bit about this process, why we even go through this process. Absolutely. So the advertisement of the scope of changes that we might consider before the board, the actual advertisement itself is required by state law, but the board weighing in to shape what the language of that advertisement is, isn't. It's a practice that's evolved in Arlington because we've learned that you cannot take a policy action outside the scope of what you've advertised. So doing these RTAs, these requests to advertise hearings, lets us as board members shape the parameters of what it is that we will then be considering with the community. I think it allows for a discussion that's more focused, uh, where people feel like uh, the concerns that they're interested in raising, they have room to raise, um, and it gives us as board members a little bit of a preview about some of those issues we really are seeking to resolve with the community and with staff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, no, I think so. I think it, it improves the advertisement. Um, and one of the things we, we talk a lot, we're always consulting our attorney because, as, as Katie said, we can't go broader, we can go narrower from what gets advertised. Okay. So, and, and every now and then we'll advertise something and realize, which we did, I think, with the, um, the, the exotic species. So you, you all of a sudden, you got to go back. You have to even re-advertise if you want to make something broader. But if you make it smaller, it's okay. So we try, when we do the authorization, is to make it, the request to authorize, we try to make it pretty broad. Um, and again, it's to get people to comment and look at it. And in fact, I've found that when we actually have something that comes before the board and we vote on it, people pay attention. Um, Otherwise, people are likely to not pay attention until it comes to it later, and then it's kind of too late to make some of the some of the changes. So it's really part of our communication mm -hmm. process. In really, many just ways. kind of get everybody on the same page to start that discussion. Yeah, yeah. And we did three of them this meeting. We did. Yeah. 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 
Where, so where do we go from here, specifically with the accessory dwellings and then the other request to advertise that we have this Absolutely. Time? So what we advertised is public hearings by the Planning Commission and the County Board, and those will take place in November. It's an opportunity to further refine the proposed zoning ordinance amendments, which I should mention um, are actually the recommendations of a work group. We're really grateful to our citizen leaders, our commissioners, um, and those who have engaged with them through an accessory dwellings work group uh, that did recommend these changes to us. So uh, the conversation continues. There'll be formal hearings by the Planning Commission and the County Board in November. And we'll look forward to making some changes in November, we hope, to encourage this use. Okay. Well, we're going to take a short break now, but when we come back, we're going to be talking GLUP and the future of 911. Stay with us. Welcome back to County Board Wrap Up, where we're chatting today with County Board Vice Chair Katie Crystal and Board Member Libby Garvey about some of those key issues that came before the County Board at its October meeting. Welcome back to both of you. Now, we mentioned we teased the GLUP, or rather, General Land Use Plan, for those not on the acronym train. Um, and the board set up public hearings on three different General Land Use Plan amendment requests. Let's specifically talk about the Washington Boulevard. What is on the table here? Absolutely. Well, it probably makes sense to back up and talk about what is the GLUP anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the GLUP is our general land use plan, as you mentioned. It is essentially the primary policy guide for development and how land will be used in Arlington. It establishes the extent and the location of different land uses, whether they be mixed, commercial, residential. Um, and we are actually required by state law to have a general land use plan. So it's a guiding document that we really return to often when it comes to uh, development and redevelopment of property in Arlington County. We, the reason we're considering um, an amendment to the GLUP, or the reason we consider uh, an amend any amendment to the GLUP, um, is that we have a, a request from property owners for parcels that lie outside of an existing sector plan. Okay. In this case, the Virginia Square sector plan. So generally, if you're going to redevelop a parcel in Roslyn or Boston or Virginia Square or somewhere along the Route 1 corridor in Pentagon City or Crystal City, we have policy guidance that the community has worked the together to shape mm -hmm. exactly yeah, in sure. the form of of sector plans or area plans. Um, this is an area, this area around Washington Boulevard and Kirkwood, um, that is a little bit outside of that community process. And so it merits its own community process. And that's what we're considering today, is those three different parcels, um, two of which are, are currently the home of some major civic and community institutions, the American Legion and the YMCA. Yeah. So that's what's on the table right now. What are they looking to, to change? What are we, what's really the grand scope Well, they're here? looking to what we call up club, which, <laughs> which is to increase the density and increase what the, because. For yet another acronym. For, yeah, no, yet another acronym. You know, and as Katie was talking about, so we have you know, sector plans and site plans in certain areas, other areas we don't, and it's usually where there's a lot of density and growth. And basically we're growing and becoming more urban. And if you drive along that section of Kirkwood mm -hmm. along Washington Boulevard, it's clear that it, we're about to get more, a little more dense, a little more. It's kind of the, the veterans of foreign wars, the VFW's post there. That was built in the 40s, I think it was. Um, and the Y is clearly, you know, really needs to be renovated and changed. And the whole area has a feel of decades ago. Um, so we're going to, they're asking for more density, in part because both of those um, nonprofits, like many nonprofits, um, they are cash poor and resource rich. So the, the property they're on has become really quite valuable because mm -hmm. um, this is a very desirable place to be, but they don't have a lot of cash to make the improvements that they need to. So what they would like to do is partner with a developer and be able to um, get more value on that land, which generally means building up mm -hmm. some. And it's, I think if you look along Washington Boulevard, that's very appropriate. It, but you need to be careful that you step down and protect the neighborhoods, which is what we always want to do. So that's kind of how we found ourselves here. And then there is also a private developer. So it's three different interests on that one spot. So it's been very um, involved uh, okay. <laughs> for you know staff and our citizens to work through. And there's a community interest here as well as a developer interest, which as Libby was describing, this really does have the feel of a type of development uh, that we no longer strive for in Arlington. It's very automobile oriented, for example. Kind of that one, two story sure. building. Sure, yeah. Parking, well, parking lots. And parking lots. And parking yes. lots yeah. is the 
more is the more important point, right? Yeah. Um, and so we really are seeing this as an opportunity to create a more pedestrian-oriented place that better reflects that sort of um, welcoming environment, more harmonious transition to the neighborhood um, that we've so deliberately tried to achieve in other parts of the county. So, um, you know, it's I, I think about it not only as the opportunity to, to modernize these civic institutions, but to achieve that sort of uh, pedestrian, bike, um, uh, accessible uh, nature that we see elsewhere, um, mm -hmm. even just in Virginia Square. Mm -hmm. And we do hear from folks who are concerned about the, de with the density, which we understand, but, you know, Virginia is what we call a by-right state, and um, if we don't um, allow a little more density on these sites, I think both the VFW and the Y are likely to not be able to afford to do the upgrades that they need to do, and it may actually force them into selling the property. If they sell the property, it could be bought by any sort of non, you know, right. a profit-making play, and suddenly we're going to lose these two, you know, really valuable community resources. So sometimes I think people, and I totally understand it, people don't want things to change, but unfortunately that's not really an option. It's something's got to change, so we're trying to manage it as well as we can for the good of everybody. And this is a, ch is, this is a chance also for the public to then provide feedback right, through the what hearing they would process. Like as, okay. we as we grow and change how they want to do it. What is staff recommending through this process that we do move forward with some of these Staff is recommending up <laughs> advertising, <laughs> advertising right. but not, yes, take we, it there. We did advertise, right, <laughs> yeah. where, where the RTA meets a glove change. So we did advertise some changes and we'd encourage people who are interested, especially those who live in the neighborhood or those who care about the future of these institutions, uh, to, to check out the proposed uh, plan that staff has developed. It's pretty comprehensive. Right. Um, it's more than just just your average board report, uh, you know, dry words on a page. There are a lot of maps. There are a lot of circulation plans. There are a lot of visions for how uh, the mature trees would be expected to be protected. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's a, it's a little bit more accessible sometimes than our average board report might be. We'd encourage those who are interested um, to check out that special proposed special GLUP Plus study <laughs> for Washington Boulevard and Kirkwood. Right. And unlike the advertisement for the affordable dwelling units, those are, that's coming back to us in November, I believe. This is not going to, this won't come back to us, the GLUP changes won't come back until there's actually a site plan. So it could okay. be actually years before we de do the follow-up vote, if you will. Yeah, mm -hmm, move forward mm -hmm, with that. Mm -hmm. So right. there is a lot of time for people to weigh in. Okay, so this will be a long-term process that it we are be. talking about for it quite some be. time. Uh, well, let's move on to a very interesting partnership, mm -hmm. so to speak, an mm -hmm. MOU mm -hmm. for another one of our um, acronyms, Memorandum of acronyms du jour. <laughs> yeah. um, this one with the city of Alexandria, yeah. and this one concerns 911 yep. services. Yeah. This is very yeah. interesting to me. Ah, well, good. It's it's. I think it's great. Um, you know, we remember back to 911, and one of the issues then was what they call interoperability, which meant that sometimes the firemen who were there, say from Arlington, couldn't talk to the firemen from the district or from Alexandria because everybody came to the scene of that event. Um, and what we found was the radios, people couldn't, t emergency responders couldn't always talk to each other. and They'd be end up using cell phones rather than their own radios. So it, that was where one of, the, one of the lessons from 9 11 was that we need to be able to work together better and we need to have equipment that can work across jurisdictions. So um, everybody's been improving in the region on that and we've actually come quite a long way. And of course, we buy uh, for like our 9 11 systems, the emergency, uh, emergency call systems, that over years changes and needs to be upgraded, and we're at that point, so is Alexandria. Um, and we cooperate with Alexandria quite a bit. In fact, with some of our fire stations really on the border run, um, run to calls in Alexandria almost more than they do in Arlington, yet they're Arlington, but also Alexandria fire stations run calls. In. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things that the more we work together, the better it is. And we realized both Arlington and Alexandria are at the same place needing to upgrade their systems um, and get it in the budget and behind it. I said, why don't we work together and really make it seamless. So when we get, we have a memorandum, a memorandum of understanding, which our board, okay, that's got to be okayed by the city council in Alexandria, and then it has to be worked out administratively. But what will happen, it happens now, but not as easily. Once we get the same system together, an emergency call in Arlington, um, if there's a problem for us to respond, it could go instantly to Alexandria and vice versa. So um, the, the person on the end of the line having the emergency won't be aware of it but it will, the call will be instantly taken to the place that can respond the fastest and the best. It also gives us backup. So we have our own uh, 911 center and we have a backup system because every now and then something sure. happens. Um, and should that be a problem, then it'll go instantly to Alexandria and Alexandria can respond for us and handle the calls or vice versa. 
sometimes you have an evacuation of the building. Sometimes mm -hmm. something happens, and the more backup um, you have, the more resilient the system is. So it also will save money because we're going together. So it's making us, I think, better service for less money um, in an area that's really important. It's important for our 911 calls to be able to handle, be handled efficiently and well, and I think we're going to improve that. And we're not talking about, just to be clear, we are not talking about merging the two services. We are not talking about cutbacks to streamline. This is just kind of working a continuity type it, of system. It, right. And we have always cooperated. What it is doing is making the cooperation even easier. We always have supported each other. And in fact, the region does. Um, if you look at it, we have agreements. Um, there are agreements actually throughout the region. I'm on the Council of Governments Emergency Preparedness Council. And one of the things we look at a little bit is the um, agreements around the whole region. So we all work with each other and have memorandums of, of understanding of different kinds um, in emergency management. Sometimes uh, in the past, at, like at 9-11, there were even legal barricades. So who could get sued for what if they crossed this line or that line? And we're basically okay. trying to erase all of that and make it seamless so that we can just, it, it's basically one regional team. So you're separate, but you also are cooperating and working together much better. Um, and as we get larger and the issues get more complex, um, the faster and more efficient and more cooperative we can be, the better we'll serve our folks. Okay. One other interesting development about the next generation 911, yeah. in addition to the uh, improvements of the interoperability or mutual aid agreements yeah. that we have that Libby mentioned, um, is the next generation piece of that, which is to try to create 911 systems, and you see it happening all across the United States, mm -hmm. that are more responsive to our wireless age. Right. Um, so allowing people to text to 911, for example, or send video as well and as And trace call. the calls, because originally 911, yeah. if it came from your landline, they knew exactly where you were as soon as you picked up the phone. And that was a problem and with that cell was a problem phones for the longest time. So that's that's yeah. getting fixed too. Yeah, there's a whole lot to bring to bring it up, and they do call it next generation 911. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. And then this this will now allow for texting, for video, for photos, for all of those GPS locations. Modern mm -hmm. modern cell phone, mobile, you know, technology mm -hmm. to really yeah. help to improve these. Plus, if it comes services. to this say this, this system say in Arlington, and for some reason we don't have it, our fire trucks are out somewhere else, and we need to go to Alexandria instead of like having to make a separate physically sort of make the right. call. It just instantly it, goes over it, there. Yeah. Okay, so better and, and speed of better response is key. better for speed of response with right. emergency services right. at right. the bottom line. All right. Well, that's one important upgrade, but another upgrade that is going that was approved was to kind of a beloved institution for Arlingtonians, and that is Central Library. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit of just you know what are some of the updates that are going to happen? Why are they needed? What, it, what can the public expect? Absolutely. So uh, folks might be surprised to find that Central Library, which feels like one of the beating hearts of Arlington's right. civic fabric, actually has not had a significant interior upgrade since the 1960s. Wow. So this is overdue, and it's an opportunity to really make sure that one of this, the most heavily trafficked spaces in our library systems is more welcoming, lively, and importantly, accessible to everyone. So folks will see uh, a number of new spaces, new meeting rooms, um, a multi purpose maker lab, which is something that I know a lot of folks in the community, in our small businesses, and a lot of our students are really excited about. Um, a redesigned public computer area, um, upgraded electrical systems, important, and perhaps most importantly, more ADA improvements, Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, or accessibility improvements to make sure that everyone who's experiencing Central Library feels welcome there, no matter what kind of mobility challenges they might have. Mm -hmm. okay. And you know, our library is about so much more than lending books <laughs> or having computers. We, I think we won an award. Um, just recently for the lending library for the ag for the tools. We have a tool shed and you can borrow garden tools. We have an energy lending library um, which we also won an award for and that like you can borrow, lend, uh, one of these machines that um, and I'm going to forget the word, but it notes your house where where the cold is coming out and where it's hot, where you've got heat leaks. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. and those are those are difficult and expensive to, to buy or do, and people. But you can just go right to the library and check one out. Oh, that's it's, interesting. It's so pretty cool. Things people never would expect to in, find exact, in a public library. Right. Yes. If you haven't visited our library lately, check it out because there's a lot going on. It's about a whole lot more than just you know books and uh, and discs and things. And the, but but the library will stay open through it this whole process, so oh, the public should not worry about. Um, oh, this to yeah. this closing for the renovations. No, this will happen during the public process, and 
have a nice refresh when That's we're all done. It, it'll be you great. You might need to partner dust, but you'll certainly <laughs> be able to come and enjoy the library for the foreseeable future. Wonderful. Well, that brings us to the end of another County Board Wrap-Up. Katie and Libby, thank you so much for joining us again today to talk about some of the actions from the October Board meeting. We will see you again next month. And remember that all County Board meetings are indeed open to the public, and they're live streamed right here on ATV. You can find the schedule and information on speaking at a board meeting on our website at countyboard.arlingtonva.us. To learn how you can get involved in county government or to make sure your voice is heard on the issues, visit us at topics.arlingtonva.us slash engage, our civic engagement webpage. That's where you can share your ideas and learn how to get involved in the county issues. We'll be back with another county board wrap up after Thanksgiving, so enjoy the holiday. We'll see you again soon. <laughs>